Yeah, let's do it. Hello. Everybody, welcome out to our final, final panel for the weekend. Has everybody had a good weekend? Awesome. Well, let's do this. Up here, I have Spencer, Hector, and Attack Peter. Two names. That's amazing. From Mondo. I'm so excited to talk to these guys. I go back really, really far with Mondo, so let's just jump right in. Everybody's microphone's working? No. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, good, there you go. go. Check, check. Spencer, how you doing, bud? I'm good, man. A bit tired. <clears throat> Spencer's in charge of the vinyl division of Mondo, which is something that when they first started doing records, I was like, they're doing what? And like a lot of things didn't totally make sense in the beginning, but you guys have really built an amazing program. And I'm so curious, you know, you guys are doing a very specific corner of the collectible market. Over the years, Spencer, how has it been working with the record labels? You know, when you guys first got in and you were repackaging and, and republishing things that have been out of print, and it's sort of transformed along where I'm assuming that the record labels are just more and more excited and you have to do a lot less chasing them down, correct? Yeah, I mean, originally back in the day when we started, it's like 10 years when you ask if you to do Jurassic Park. And they're yeah. like, why do you want to release that on vinyl? Like, no one wants to buy that. Um, and now it's like we're about to release, I can talk about it because this, we've kind of teased it. We're about to release Severance next week. And we've worked with uh, Apple, Fifth Season, Endeavor. And the packaging has gone absolutely crazy. And they've been involved every step of the way. And they've kind of encouraged us to go, go further with it. Um, and I think now that because vinyls, you know, the story is every year, vinyl sales are higher than they've ever been. Vinyl now is the biggest selling physical format. So most studios and most majors understand the value of us releasing their vinyl. And then we get to the point where we work with Toho so, you know, we just released Matango. This is the first time it's ever been released on vinyl. Yeah. And Toho trusted us enough to do it. You know, I mean, to me, that's like pretty incredible. To be and really, that's the story of a career. You know, it's a struggle to do your first ones. Nobody really understands it. But that first project is a proof of concept. And now you can show that to people and gain more and more trust until you get the moment where you're at with Severance where you're working with Apple on one of their best shows, a beautifully designed show, and they're saying, we know what you guys are capable of, blow us away. And that's really where we're all working towards, right? To get that relationship where suddenly you're not calling everybody, but your phone's actually ringing. I think the key for us is to, uh, to work with the creators. Like, we, we never want to just release a record with just our design that just gets approved by, like, a suit somewhere. To yeah. work with like the director, the composer, like producers, the writers, like everyone involved. That's like the stamp of approval. And for me, that you just can't get better than that. And I also think for a collectible company, it must be such a celebrated win when in the beginning you're taking old IP and kind of giving it new life. Nobody's ever seen Jurassic Park on vinyl, let's do that. But then all of a sudden, if you do it right, it starts to turn a corner where they're like, hey, we're releasing this new thing in March of next year. Is it too late to get on board so we have a project with you guys in March of next year, right? Yeah, day, day and date for us now is big. Like when we first started originally, it was just reissues. So right. it was all just diving into the back catalog. But then obviously there springs up like 10 other soundtrack labels. So we're all diving into that back catalog. That kind of dries up quickly. So then to be working on things that are due out or coming out, like, you know, we just released the new Hellraiser and we had six weeks from seeing it to releasing it till it debuted on <laughs> Hulu. And they were like, can we go day and date? Because it helps marketing, you know? And it's like, they want, they want that cool vinyl piece out in the market as well. Well, I think that we're seeing, you know, Hector, we're seeing a really different world of marketing because the world's so noisy it's so loud and like the most original day and day release that i saw this year was when universal hollywood studios opened up a jordan pill area oh, yeah, the for same no. friday that the movie dropped you know and you guys being so you know in the movie industry you got to be paying attention to things like that that the studios are trying to get really creative on new ways to find customers and to get that word of mouth going because the old school method is broken and gone yeah absolutely i mean i think we always have to reinvent 
how we're presenting our product to, right. to our audience and uh, finding new and fresh ways to making it exciting and make it stand out over um, you know, uh, all the noise and everything else that's out there. And it's interesting too to go from being what started out as a collectible company as the world's changed, you guys have also partially become a marketing company, right? A marketing asset to different people that want to figure out a new way to reach the most hardcore of their consumer. Right. I think so. I think we've be become a platform for a lot of artists in general. I mean, Peter, you know, we, he he's now a part of Mondo, right? But it was a, a it was an avenue or a, a vehicle for for him to put his stuff out or a, 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 our you know other artists that we work with. Well, before we do, I just want to say, since Sony Pictures Animation is probably watching, Spencer, he's not going to say it for himself, but he's throwing his hat in the ring for voice acting. So, I mean, you heard that, Timber. Uh, you know, don't pass up this opportunity. Get them while you can. You know what I'm saying, Sony? All right, let's talk about me now. <laughs> so Peter is like the uh, Art Bruce Springsteen of Florida, because anybody who's Miami, from... it's technically Florida. Uh, okay. We like the... to be referred separately. Thank you. I, I like that you say that because I've now talked to three or four different artists from Miami. Like, man, back in the day, Attack Peter was doing this thing in the in the small con circuit, and his prints were higher, most expensive ones, and he was earning his stripes. And like, people are excited to see you at this level of your career. You're like a folk hero to those folks. Well, they're excited to take some of the prints they paid 40 bucks for and sell them on eBay for hundreds of dollars. And I'm I'm excited for them, frankly, because <laughs> that's, the, that's the, the promise I make to anybody who buys my stuff, that the value is going to increase. So hold on to it. The eBay booth's here. You just walk on over, drop it. Let's go. But that is a commitment to an audience, though, right? Yeah. I know you're having fun, but that is a yeah. commitment to Mondo and its customers. Like, we make a great product, yeah. one of the most high-end products in the market. We sell it for a fair rate, and there's a chance that it's gonna go up in, in time, right? Dude, the thing, the reality is Mondo's special because, and why it's such an honor for me to work with them now, is it's different than just people who have a great idea, let's make this, because we want to see it. It's, they're curating something. It's, we love this property. It's gotten some love, but not the way we want to give it to it. Not the eye that we have, not the idea we have. They take risks. I mean, Hector's battle cap that he just dropped is a perfect example of it, but so was taking a chance on me doing linoleum block prints. Right. Even when I started, I wasn't sure, just because it hadn't been done to that extent before, I wasn't sure if anybody was gonna really respond to it. And they gave me an opportunity with Godzilla right off the bat. So like, it was huge and it, and it catapulted uh, people's awareness of me into a different stratosphere. I'm eternally grateful for it. I just can't wait to do everything we got planned. Well, you know, it, having done adventures in design for a long time now and been a part of the different Mondo cons, I've done 1,600 episodes, and you have that many conversations about creativity, you start to see the patterns. And your career is the story of Mondo. Here's a guy that loves Kaju, loves Asian-inspired artwork, but does a traditional old-school printing method. You took two worlds and you mashed them together. Mondo's like, we love movies, we love all of our friends that are the best illustrators in the industry, and you guys mashed that up. And then it was toys and vinyl. So it's that same business model of, we love these two things, and if I love them, I'm pretty sure other people will. And when you go to something like MondoCon, you can start to think everybody knows about this world, right? Because we see the huge long lines that Mike Mitchell or Jason Edmondson has. We have this whole room full of people that celebrate the same art world. And I record podcasts there, and then I release them. People are like, who are these people, you know? And so even though in our world it seems precious and really big, there's so much room for this company to scale and keep going to new and new consumers and building that fan base, correct? Yeah, I mean, we, we live in a bubble, right? I mean, we, yes. we think we're huge. We've got a huge booth, big presence here. We think everyone knows who we are. But, like, you quickly go outside and you realize that even people who buy this stuff, not everyone knows who we are, right? So you can always find, like, new fans, new customers. You can always connect with people. If it's through a different property like Dread or, you know, J Jaguar, someone's going to be into that and then they'll kind of find us and then see everything else. Like, for the, for the booth, we just bought a record player and set up a record player so people just could go, come along and listen to the soundtrack. That's amazing. And I think you're absolutely right, Spencer, on the bubble of Mondo. And over the last year, as many people know, Funko has come on board to be a collaborator and an investor. 
And I think what Funko saw in your company was, there's this company that means so much to people that are in the bubble. Let's grow that bubble or burst that bubble because you guys make such great products for so many things that people love. Like my brother-in-law, for example, didn't know that he wanted to collect silkscreen posters until for Christmas, I gave him a Guardians of the Galaxy by Tom Whalen, and now he's got the Mike Mitchell Star Wars portraits. Like He didn't know that he loved this stuff until somebody like me invited him to the party, brought him into the bubble, and he's so far out of this world that I just keep thinking like through more money, more distribution, it'll be interesting to see where this scales to. I also think like seeing it in person, right? It's, it's cool to see like a silk screen poster sure. on a screen, but when you're here and you're like in the booth and like you can talk to any of our staff, like everyone is like on point. Everyone knows everything about the product because they love it. And you can see it, you can touch it. It's like tangible. Me and Peter were talking about this. Records, it's like it's a tangible way to listen to music. Right, right. For us this year, we really, you know, one thing I wanted to do was have our uh, soft vinyl toys on, like, in a place where people can come and grab them. Right. You know, it's like whole pick, pick up space Godzilla, you know, feel the vinyl, you play with it, move the arms, move the tails, and, and we just wanted people to have that tactile experience. Yeah, you know, one of the downsides to like Kaju and soft vinyl. It just doesn't photograph like it feels. Exactly. Right? And a lot of the different iridescent finishes and color gradients and one of ones, that just doesn't translate from a web store where you're looking at a 400 by 400 square shot on a starch white background, right? Right, right. right. So, Hector, like, looking at how the company is evolving with more financial resources, let's talk about the Battle Cat, for example. Okay. There's two variants. Uh, well, there's Panthor and Battle Cat. Okay, yeah. my bad. I'm not, the, <laughs> I'm not the biggest He-Man guy. I couldn't get past the haircut. One's purple, one's green. Got it. As Rob Jones said, you like this Maleficent one, motherfucker? <laughs> uh, so you have two of those. Right. But because of where you're at with resources, how many alternate heads were you able to produce that the customer can snap on and take off to change the menace of the cat? So when, when we were developing it, we it's all about... I mean, we're fans. Like we, we love I what we're we doing. I think we figured that part out. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> so, I it was never an option not to have the heads. Yeah. It was always going to come with all the different heads you could display. Yeah. And so for us, it was just a no-brainer. And then, I mean, when it comes to the, what the Panther, it, it, you know, traditionally in, in old Masters of the Universe toys, Panther was just use the same tooling as, as Battle Cat. It was right. the same molds. Right. Right. So, but we wanted to offer something more unique, new heads, new, new designs. We, Mattel's let us take some, you know, creative liberties with all their awesome properties. So, so now with the uh, restructuring of the company, are you guys able to increase production times? Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, we, it's, it's, it's been a handful of months but we've seen just the tremendous support that Funko's offered us is insane. Yeah. I mean, you know, the booth right there, for example, like yeah. they, they let us just go do your thing. We can come and build it for you. I mean, as a fellow creative, you look at having a, a partnership company come along and be like, if you're going to let us keep doing more of what we love, let's do it. Let's roll. Right. And that, and that, well, there's that, that's, that, that was the pitch to yeah. us, you know, from the beginning. Right. I mean, it was always, we just want you to be you, and we just want you to be a part of this. Here's our amazing resources and support. Peter, what are you seeing right now in the poster and print world that's getting you excited? Dude, I, what's this guy's name over at uh, Unbox that I bought that visible invisible man from? Uh, oh, I, forgot, I forgot his name. His, I know what his Instagram is because it's super weird. It's all rat farts, but um, I don't know why he would choose that. But the amazing toy design here is so inspiring. Uh, Shout out, even though it's our guy, Mike Sutfin, who did the Hidora Anatomy poster that now is being turned into a, uh, an amazing, uh, I, we want to call it a toy. It's like a freaking work of art, this anatomy of Hedora figure. But uh, I'm a company man, Mark, and I really just like everything Mondo makes best. And then Funko second. But that's <laughs> what I like. You know what I mean? You know, uh, I think we should talk about that Hedora, though, which is yeah. something that's pretty cool that we've never done before, right? Yeah. It, each one of those Hedera prints are ones of ones. Wow. You, it's all printed on separate, uh, different types of paper, different colors. And that's the kind of stuff that we're going to start, you know, just keep doing more 
more exclusive things, more more just art-driven things. And Having an intimate relationship with the company and knowing the inner workings, a lot of the different characters, you guys bring up Mike Sutphin, who's one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. Ever. But when I interviewed him in his basement in Oakland, and after we were done having the conversation, he's like, you want to see some of my work I've done? I was like, well, yeah, of course. And he started just showing me one painting after another, hand-done painting, that looked like it was done in Photoshop. I mean, just the most unbelievable stuff that at the time he was doing for Dungeons and Dragons. And I love how Mondo is taking people like Sutphin and say, look, you're a really good fit for this Spider-Man project, that, that amazing Spider-Man project that he did that was both for the Amazing Spider-Man and Amazing. But I love the, the pairing of you guys taking these artists that are so good at what they do, they just didn't have a home to put 400 hours into an illustration. And Mondo gave those people a home. You know, when I look at all the work that Edmonston did, Eyes Without a Face started at the Mondo Gallery. That was a Mondo birth project, you know? And so if we kind of look at Mondo almost like a studio that, you know, does projects, you know, like the movie studios do, you guys have been really good at partnering up, offering distribution and resources to give some of our friends just that headspace to get lost in a creative process and not have 50 client jobs that you're juggling yeah, all at once. No, exactly. And not only that, there's the creative direction is that you would ever get as an artist working with Mondo is just like that thing you did that we saw that we love, continue to do that. Yep. Let us know if something's on fire. Otherwise, just do your thing. And that's phenomenal, not only because it's, you don't, you don't feel encroached upon, but you also feel encouraged. Like, you've been doing something, right? And because the company name means something to you as a creator, you're like, wow, I did a good thing. You know, yep. you get that approval from your peers that you respect so much. Yeah. And kind of talking about how the Mondo business model is the proper or successful business model for a creative that goes where you want to go, you just said what we said a minute ago, do more of what you're doing. And that's exactly the Funko relationship to you guys, right? Like the, the yes. tables got turned a little bit, do more awesome shit. Yeah. No, no, pretty much. I mean, it, it, it became obvious right away when they were just like, dude, what you, what you all are doing is amazing and just keep going. Just yeah. keep, you know, we, we're, we're, we're here to support. So in 2023, do we see MondoCon come back? Well, it's, 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 it's a hella amount of planning. And uh, our good friend who's just come back on, Amy, to run all our events, we're looking into when we can do it again. Just Austin is like, you've got to book like two years in advance now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's insane. But we'd love to do it again. Because I feel like MondoCon is like, really special and yeah. I think it helped forge a lot of friendships and you know helped us working with artists and just like leveled up everyone so yeah definitely we want to do it again just when yeah I mean having been a part of I think three of them it, there was such a great synergy in the room you know and I think what I enjoyed the most about it was I've always loved when I've been in Austin, whether it was for South by Southwest for Flatstock back in the day or the, the Mondo Cons, I always particularly enjoyed going the night before it opened at 2 a.m., talking to all the people out there in the folding chairs that are already in line that are tailgating for artwork, right? Like, there are people that tailgate for artwork, and out of all the things you could tailgate for, that's pretty fucking cool. And I love that you guys have built a community that, you know, believes in the brand. And, and I was just talking to the guys over at Lincoln, like, you know, the first time I found out about the company, I'm like, they don't make anything. They don't sell anything. Because I went to the website and they had two items. And then I clicked a little bit deeper. I'm like, oh, that's because the other 1,200 items are all sold out. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. That's, that's kind of been the, the, how people discover it is usually going to our website and everything's sold out. Right. So, so we're, you know, we're hoping to have a bit more stuff available. No, but, <laughs> you know. but we've been doing the uh, timed editions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've been exploring different avenues. Like with, with our most recent one six scale figure releases, we've been doing timed editions to just let people have the opportunity to buy it, and it within a certain time. So we keep that exclusivity there. Um, and, and we never go back to that figure again. Once, once you know, the Battle Cat, it was one week. Once that's done, it's done. You're, we're not going to do that version of Battle Cat again. If I'm not mistaken, the first big time edition was the Batman, right? There was a Batman poster that was, the, I think, one of the very yeah, first ones. Yeah, one of, one of the first that yeah. we did, yeah. And I think that a lot of artists looked at how many were sold, pulled out their calculator, and said, holy shit, that's real money. And I think 
that started to really show that there was a moment where artists could pair up with the right IP, with the right visual artist, and really work passionately on a project and make serious money. Because a lot of times, we're the last person to be thought of in the budget. Put all this money in a movie, pay all the actors, get all the FX to, to be perfect, and then at the very end, you're like, eh, we don't really have a budget, but we need a poster for the movie, you know? And that was a moment where it was kind of going the other way around. And as a fellow creative, I was like, yeah, people are getting paid, and this is fucking awesome. I think also the timed editions is like a chance to get for the people who are not quick enough on a drop that sells out in 20 seconds. It's a chance for them to get something from right. us that is exactly the same quality of something we only make 200 of. So it's like it's a good it's a good gateway for people to like to have something and then be like, oh cool, I can buy things from this company. Yeah, with the timed editions to add to that, the amount of new fans that yeah. get exposed. It's it's important, right? To just you know, even with something like Battle Cat, where we had a whole lot of new fans just come and find Mondo just through that. And if it had been, you know, if we had just left it up for a day or an hour or so, they we would have probably never reached those five hundred thousand, however many they were. Yeah, and the cool thing about a timed edition is it it's what the market decided upon, right? Mm -hmm. That many right. fans, that property, that artist, that budget. And, but it's also a capsule in time, right? Like, you, you, you can't go back and reopen that up, and you have to honor that. Yeah, and, you have to. If you don't, then it cheapens that experience. You broke. You, you broke, yeah, you break their trust at the same yeah. time, too. Yeah. So, it, it, yeah, like you're saying, it does become that moment in time, that release, and that's it, and it's over. Peter, as a guy that was hustling and, and doing your own thing, did you kind of wrestle a little bit when you got invited to come on board the team? No, 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 please. I mean, I, I, I jumped at the opportunity. The funny thing is I was working before um, independently as a teacher for 13 years and right. doing my art on the side. So I'm, I like getting a paycheck and a salary and health insurance and all that. So I've me, heard about these things, but I've never seen these you're things. You're going to love it. Those are things. Me. Just hold on, man. Just keep going. You know, and so... Um, I, I made, had a great relationship with Skybound Entertainment, and they took a chance on me, created this opportunity for an artist to be in-house, get a salary, and still work on what they're working on. And so at some point, you know, I realized that uh, at Mondo, there's some things that we could do and explore that I wasn't able to do before. And same thing, they just said, we would love to have you, and not only that, we'll let you work on a few other things. You know, we'll, we'll test you out, see how you do. And uh, some, I can pitch things that are not even Attack Peter related. I just have yeah. ideas in my head and go boom. And it makes total sense because it's what I do all day. I think about this would be cool, this would be cool, and I make it and I make it. But sometimes I'm like, you know what? I don't need to have my style design on this for this to be cool. What do you guys think? Pass it over and, and they're listening. And it's such an amazing, amazing opportunity. I hope more artists get it. I hope more companies realize that, that you could pay an artist a salary to be in your company and get that rare insight that only they get. 100%, because it's a whole different way of seeing the world. It's a different language that we speak. And I, and I love the, the notion of, you know, you as a visual artist or Rob Jones as a visual artist or, uh, you know, the, the different folks you guys had of creative directors over the years. You get to a moment where you're like, this movie and this artist would be awesome. And I don't have to put my thumbprint on it. And that's my most uh, excited. That's my most exciting thing for me right now. Like walking around the floor, there's a bunch of artists that I'm like, oh, now that I have a little bit of pull, and I could, you know, write. I'm yeah. gonna be like, Mitch, Eric, you guys gotta do a poster with this guy, and like, you know, uh, Hector, what about this guy doing this thing, you know? And it's just, it's just awesome to have that opportunity because that's probably my favorite thing is connecting those dots. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. Because if you're a lover of pop culture and you're a lover of the creatives in that space, seeing those two worlds come together and creating that new version of, you know, something that we've all seen before, or in your all's case, you know, seeing people that are doing something original and be like, there's something here. And with a little bit of support, a little bit of investment, sort of quiet down that artist's world and let them focus, something great could come from here. I do think that, you know, Mondo can be a platform for artists in that way. Any independent artists and stuff like that, and, and, and they can use our resources, just us as a brand, to help them and help get the, the exposure they may need or they may want, whatever it may be. 
The Mondo bump is real, dude. I launched my first three posters with them March of 2020. Never look back. After that, everything, the value of everything went up. All the offers I got to do gigs went up. Everything went through the roof just by releasing the posters. So it's real. I love that's the way that you remember March of 2020 because I have a very different version of it in my head. Oh, I had a great time. <laughs> Thank you, Mondo, man. That was great. <laughs> that is a Super great memory to have. As we're wrapping up today, you know, the company started with licensing. The licensing space has gotten very crowded over the last couple of decades. I mean, not, not necessarily crowded, but there's a lot more people in the space, we'll Saturation. say. Saturation. Yeah. How has that been for you guys? You know, is it easier to sign the deals? I mean, I know that you're a trusted brand and you probably have a lot of your partners that you work with over and over again, but do you find, you know, because every time I saw an article, podcasting's getting bigger. It only made my job harder because there was a saturation of fatigue. And, you know, eventually I was just like, I'm not going to do interviews anymore because nobody writes back. I'll just talk to myself. How have you guys dealt with the fact that so many other people have gotten in this space, but at the same time, you guys have also put in your seniority and shown that you can do a great product? I don't, I don't think about other people. I mean, obviously, I check out what other, sure. you know, especially for music. I check out other labels. You know, I buy a ton of records. I don't worry about them. We just, we just look at what we love, no matter how different it is. You know, there was a week we released the Disney soundtrack, and then we released this crazy Italian splatter movie called Porno Holocaust in the same week. So it's like... Whatever we love, especially like me and Mo, like in, yeah. in the music, we have very different tastes, yeah. but it works. And I think it's helped the label over the, like, the last 10 years because now we can release Dirty Dancing and we can release Severance yeah. or Twin Peaks or, you know, whatever. By the way, you and Mo run at a record label is the greatest buddy movie that hasn't been made yet. <laughs> For real, yeah. But, you know, kind of taking that con that question from maybe a little bit of a different angle, not so much worried about what other people are doing, but do you ever get conversations from some of your licensing partners or where you hit them up for something like, eh, we've kind of already done this with that person. You know, that's kind of how saturation starts to bottleneck you a little bit. Yeah, especially in toys. Yeah, yeah with toys, it's, it's the constant, okay, who's not done it already? Who right. hasn't done this scale? Who right. hasn't done, you know, this style? Right. So we try to when we approach licensors, approach at the angle of, can we add something new to your characters? Like with Toho, can we do Toho soft vinyl? Can we make Godzilla pink? Can we do glow in the darks like, like Morrison and Bullmark and all that stuff? Um, with with, with Mo Masters of the Universe, can we update your designs? Can we add this? Can we add that? And and that's, that's how we d differentiate ourselves from what other competitors or other companies are doing. And the main thing I know about the licensing world is that's what they're looking for, a yeah. difference maker. You know, we don't want everybody, we don't want three people making the exact same product. So the, the fact that you guys are so niche and you have so many relationships with different artists, you can draw up a vision of like, I know there's other people making Battle Cat projects, but right. nobody's making one like this, right? Right, right. Or, or no one's ever making a Attack Peter Godzilla collectible. Right. right, and that when we approached them to do that, it was the first of its kind in the sense of it was an artistic, completely artistic reinterpretation of an otherwise like very guarded and protected IP. You know, like Toho normally does not extend that to anybody. Yeah, and that's but they also had the confidence and the chops to pull it off because, like, translating a two-dimensional lino cut as a 3D figure, like they, you know, Toho was gonna say, "Yeah, I believe that you can do that, and it would be awesome." So that's part of it, you know. And and I think in the world of licensing, probably your competitive edge is so many relationships with so many artists, where you can show up and say, "Hey, this by Attack Peter." And it doesn't matter what everybody else is doing. There's only one of him. Only one person has exactly. their style. And that really gives you a competitive edge in things. Well, guys, I'm excited to talk to you. I've been excited to hear about the acquisition or the, the investment because I know what you're capable of. And I just hope that we'll all get to see a lot more of it. And the booth and the product line makes me feel like that that's where we're headed. So thank you. Oh, shout out to Chris Everett for the booth design for Mondo. Where'd yeah, he go? I don't, he was here a second ago. But yeah, he Chris was designed here. the whole booth. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I remember when he was Silent Giants. I go way back. <laughs> <laughs> and if we'd like to form a lineup here, they have some items that they'd like to give away to anybody that's nice enough to show up today. 
Yeah, yeah. I'm just giving our profit away <laughs> this weekend. We, we've got some, um, we got some toys and some records. Yeah, I yeah, bought, I bought a couple of copies of Dread, which this version was only available in the UK. We only pressed 300. It's signed by the artist Luke Priest. If you can drop me a good 2000 AD reference, I'll give you one of those. <laughs> and then uh, I bought a copy of Matango and a copy of Space Amoeba to give away. We got a bunch of uh, some of the Decon exclusive um, Red Jet Jaguars, a firefighter colorway. We have our sold out Cherry Blossom, Glow in the Dark, and the regular edition. So, All right, so we're gonna do this Bozo's Grand Prize game. I'm gonna lay it out on the stage. First person gets first pick until we're out of material. Does that work? Perfect for me. Attack Peter, Hector, and Spencer, thank you guys so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Spencer, you, man. I honked at you in downtown LA and waved at you, staring at me like, who the fuck is that? So remember this face. <laughs> I was driving through, driving through downtown LA in the Arts District on a Saturday night, and I honked and waved at you, and you're just like... Yeah, well, I mean, why would anyone look up walking down <laughs> at downtown LA, man? I was, like, trying to avoid all the mess on the floor. <laughs> All right, everybody, thank you so much for coming out. Thanks, everyone. Thank we thank are you. done, and I am done. What an amazing Decon 2022. Can't wait to do it next year. We'll see you all in December.